Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Sarani Sembang. Yes, uh, it's me again, Vernon Adrian Emong, your uh, intrepid host here, trying to bring together as many Sarani people as possible to uh, talk about various issues um, beyond country and western music and suji cake. Yeah. Um, well, this week is the twelfth uh, episode, and so I've been doing this for the last twelve weeks. Um, we've had a number of guests over the 12 weeks and uh, in recent times we've had even people who actually don't identify as Sarani but have links to Sarani, uh, the Sarani identity in that either they might have married into Sarani families and communities or have even Eurasian children because they are in an interracial marriage. Um, and usually just to inform you when I come up with the uh, topics for the shows I look at the calendar um, for the world and I try to figure out, okay, what's the what's happening on the 5th of um, September this week? Um, I found out that it was the anniversary of the enforcement of the uh, ILO, International Labour Organization's um, Convention for Indigenous and Tribal Peoples, and it was enforced in 1991. So I thought, okay, why don't I use Indigenous people as a topic for this show? And so what I did was I went through my Rolodex of uh, Sarani people, and I've come up with two gentlemen who will join me. Um, and for the first gentleman, he might he will be very familiar um, to most of us on the Sarani Sembang uh, group page because he and I um, usually have lots of uh, confrontations, but we've always been cordial with each other. Um, we might be, you know, we might be pretty strong in how we feel about some things, but we've always had time for each other. And I'm actually very, very happy to have him. And this is the second time that I'm attempting to have him. So let's hope his internet connection hangs on. How are you there, Dr. Richard Dorrell? Hello. Hello, Vernon. Good evening. Nice ah. to see you. Yes, I hope you. That I hope the internet remains stable and I don't get kicked off like I did yes, the last yes. time. Yeah, well, so far so good. I think it's all very good and we've worked it out, I think. Um, very happy to have you um, with me this evening. Um, now, you are involved in indigenous, uh, in, in an indigenous community, but not here in Malaysia, right? Can you just give us a little bit of an insight, a very quick insight into what your connection is? Um, my connection with the indigenous uh, people was through my research. Uh, I did my um, uh, thesis research in the Philippines from 1977 to 1980. Right in the Philippines, it was it took much longer than I had anticipated. I had gone there. Uh, on the expectation that the research might only take between six to nine months. But I ended up um, being sent to the Cordillera Mountains in northern Luzon, okay. which are tribal people. And I suddenly found myself having to switch from a sociological economic approach, which could have been done in six months to nine months, to an anthropological approach, which is much slower and much uh, more um, determined by the community rather than you determining your research. Uh, okay, can, can, can you explain uh, just what the difference is from, from what you were sent there to do and then you switch to the anthropological uh, 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 research aspects of it? What, what, what? Well, the anthropological research, originally I had gone Mm -hmm. to study the the uh, situation mm -hmm. in Mindanao because of the relationship between uh, the southern Mindanao Island and Malaysia at that time. Okay, right. Um, and this is in the mid-1970s. The My sponsor, the Ford Foundation, advised right. me not to go to uh, Mindanao because the Philippine government might misunderstand what a right. Malaysian was doing in Mindanao yeah. and think yeah. I was in gun running or supporting the right. Mindanao Liberation Front. 
Yeah, so, it's a little bit of a difficult situation there. Isn't very it? difficult situation okay. at the time. So, so I, you went up north. I met a couple of uh, priests, actually, uh, in the Philippine Association for Intercultural Development, where I was sitting there with a long face, wondering how to switch my research topic. Okay. And they invited me up into the Cordillera Mountains, assuring me that, look, it's safe, uh, there's no problem there, you're not going to have any issues. And so I went. And that is a strongly tribal society in the mountains. Right. And okay. they have their own methodologies and ways of doing things. And what were, you, what were you looking at? What, what, what were you... Development. Oh, okay. Impact of development on the local communities. Okay. And I was quickly introduced to two major issues. Right. One was the um, logging in the mountains, a 200, 300,000 hectare logging project that okay. the community was objecting to. And on the other side of the drainage divide, the hydroelectric dams along the Chico right. River, which those communities were objecting to. So I suddenly right. found myself uh, in a rapidly evolving um, situation which uh, became quite uh, violent oh violent when, mm -hmm. oh yes because it, it started with the community and the local government and the community and the local government then approached the <laughs> central <laughs> government yeah so as an academic you were embroiled in all this kerfuffle well i i, I was studying it i mean i was uh, okay. uh, um, uh, uh, trying to see w what the various issues are. Then mm. the Philippine Communist Party decided to move up from the lowlands into the mountains and got they got themselves involved. So I found myself studying everywhere. I was, I was, uh, Marcos government, the local government, the uh, uh, local communities, tribal people, Communist Party, National Democratic Party, the whole, except the Muslims. Right. Okay. <laughs> so it was a fascinating... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, period and it took three years. Okay, so you're there for three years, and yes. and then what happened? No, that was that was I was collecting data and uh, 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 I then wrote it up, and um, and I have not uh, I maintained a continuous uh, connection to the yep. Cordillera Mountain ever since. Okay. And then, and then consequence of that, uh, I believe something happened in your life. Yes, I married uh, a young lady from there. Yes. Okay. Um, from one of the uh, indigenous communities. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And here is a picture of your mother, right? And your mother is a cook. K O C H. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the picture on the left is my my own mother, and yes. she is from the Koch family. But yes. uh, it's in pronounced in German it will be Koch, but K O C H right. is uh, they pronounce it Koch. Okay. I did not know my grandfather. He died before I was born. Which where is she from? Is she from Penang or Malacca or you know one of the surrounding hotspots? No, no. Uh, ah, that's a very good question. No, uh, Kuala Lumpur. Okay. Okay, Kuala Lumpur. Right. Yeah. yeah, I believe there was a Coke family who was who was uh, very well established, and they lived in the uh, in the uh, what's that area now called? Uh, just off Jalan Weld, right? Is that where your is that where she's from? You don't know. Very yeah, probably my my okay. my grandfather uh, taught at the Victoria Institution. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. He was one of the senior teachers there, yeah. and yeah. he he was in the Burger Union. In the 1920s, right, and then headed and became president of the Slango Eurasian Association in 1931-32. Wow. Okay. Right, and, and it was under years him. Of, uh, it would have been the early years of the uh, Eurasian Association. When was I it think first? they were formed in 1919 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and actually, it, yeah, 18 And I was told that mm -hmm. he was instrumental. Yeah. in organizing the Eurasians at that time who right. were uh, divided among the burghers and they had their own union, the right. Anglo-Indians yeah. and the Anglo-Burmans and everybody yeah. 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 and got them to all agree 
to come under one umbrella right called eurasia right okay so this happened in the 1930s uh okay in the, Let's look in at the, the 1930s picture. yes that's your that's your mother who is the daughter of that president of of, of the eurasian association back then right and on the other right. side is uh, your is that's your marriage right and it's your mother-in-law your, yes. your your filipino mother-in-law and yes. uh your wife's your wife's indigenous community is referred to as what is what what is their name what is the name of the community Tingyan. sorry Tingyan. yeah Tingyan, which is yeah. uh like Tingi, like highlands right highlanders yeah okay and this is you getting married in the philippines in the philippines what in the benedict 1984. okay 1984. 1984 and the priest uh the priest on the left is a Society of Divine Word Missionary, right, and the uh, seminarian in the middle who organized the wedding is today yep. a monsignor. Okay, well, yeah, okay, everybody's grown up. <laughs> Everybody grows up, okay. and this is this is a good picture. Yeah, another time, yeah, taken at that time, yes. Your wife's name is Violet. Yeah, Violet, and I'm hoping yeah. that Violet can join us later down the line. Yeah, we'll try and get her. Yes, the stuff that you do the projects that you do with indigenous people. Right. Yes, Violet, and you with your two sons, and their names are? Uh, the younger son is Lewis, and okay. the older one is James. Okay, James and Lewis. James is 34 now, Lewis is 27. Okay, a strapping young man, very good. Okay, and this is your Filipino family? Other family, yes, uh, family right. members, yes. In the Philippines? Uh, we can't get a picture like that here in Malaysia. I don't seem to have any family. They all migrated. I see. Okay. They fled. And then, so it's now to you Australia. Are, yes. And various, yeah. All we have, all of us have got family everywhere, right? Right. Uh, diaspora that is the Eurasian diaspora around the world. Right. Okay. And, you, and you're a member of the Rotary Club of Ampang and uh, a president. You I, are the this president. year, yes. Uh, starting in July 1st, I will be for the next one year president of the Rotary Club of Ampang. Okay. Congratulations on your. Thank president. you. <laughs> and of course, we all know the Rotary Club does a lot of good stuff. Okay, now this picture that you sent me, I just wanted to show show everybody. Uh, is you, okay. Tell tell us about this picture. Well, this is a the piazza of mm -hmm. our where we have our home in what is called the New Makati in the Philippines. Okay. okay. Uh, the official name is Fort Bonifacio Global City. It right. is a uh, planned um, ultra modern city held okay. up as a icon of uh, architectural and planned development. Which okay, it Manila looks very lacks. Nice. Yeah. Okay. It looks very stylish and everything. Yeah. How, it far is. Is it, how far is it from your wife's tribal village? By bus, thirteen hours. Thirteen hours. Um, Twelve to thirteen hours. And you and I uh, and you mentioned to me that this is the perhaps maybe one of the most modern parts of the Philippines, right? Of, of Manila and the Philippines, yes. Okay, so and and there's a there's a there's a great disparity between what we're seeing here and perhaps maybe your wife's uh, tribal village community. Well, yes. Now that raises the very interesting point, which I'm sure uh, Colin will also. Yes, our next uh, guest. Uh, uh, yes, our next guest will also touch is, is how uh, indigenous people living in wooden villages without water, some many without yeah. electricity, yeah. how they have been able to adapt to the new world and rapidly adapt to the new world. Yeah. Uh, they're all uh, people in um, uh, my study area, Abra, they're, you can find yeah. them all over the world. They're in the Hawaii, then in the US, then in Italy, Malaysia, yeah. all over. And so your involvement with the Rotary Club in Ampang uh, also contributed to some of right. what's going on in your wife. So in two, 2013, yeah. we uh, visited, uh, decided, look, we're going to have a, a structure a format now in, in order to assist uh, tribal people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the village that we chose to yeah. assist. Uh, yeah. They were uh, uh, getting their water supply from the river, bathing in the river, washing in the river. Yeah. And we decided to propose, uh, we proposed to, to provide them pipe water supply. Right. Uh, 
brought from five kilometers away by gravity flow to the village of 1,000 people. The village has 1,000 people. Yeah. And uh, it was a, a project starting in 2013 to the present. We provided education supplies, the local school, uh, okay. clothes, shoes, okay. water. Okay, so so your your involvement with the indigenous community started with uh, with your with your uh, study 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 trip, um, and then you met somebody, fell in love, and I guess right. uh, the rest is history, and and you you know became more embedded into the indigenous community, and uh, I've got lots of pictures here. Um, your yeah. your uh, wife it got involved. Typical in pictures, yes. Nursery. Yep, and they painted it and set it up. And right. this is the audience where your wife gave, gave a talk. I hope she'll yeah. come in and talk with us about Yeah, about I hope so. That. Yeah, and, uh, and she's also working with the schools. Um, yeah, fantastic. These are the primary school children. These are young ladies in tribal costume. Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Uh, um, do you kind of like see kind of like similarities between uh, their tribal culture and perhaps maybe our cultures? Okay, I think the most important difference, um, and this is where we may want to discuss later the Malaysian perspective. Yeah. These Cordillera uh, indigenous people successfully defended their territory over 300 years from Spanish colonialism, the mm -hmm. Spaniards could not enter the mountains and they were and consequently couldn't Christianize them. OK, right until the beginning of the 20th century. Then okay. the Americans came. There was the war between uh, between America and the lowland Filipinos who had declared independence in 1898. Then the Americans sent the troops to Mindanao, Muslim Mindanao, and that battle was took place right until uh, uh, 1913. Mm -hmm. And then the Americans said, oh, now what about this other vast area in the mountains? And they got cold feet. The American army got cold feet. They didn't dare okay. get into the mountains. So. Because they the terrain, sent uh, anthropologists mm -hmm. to go and study the people there and in doing so created the field of cultural anthropology just as a matter of interest. Okay. And they then reported back to the government, the mm -hmm. uh, governor general, American governor general, look, these are this is what we found. And the Americans said, oh, my goodness, we better not go there. Yeah. So they sent a new breed of missionaries to enter the mountains but having expelled all the Spanish missionaries who literally were converting people at the point of a gun right. a weapon yeah. Yeah. the new missionary had a new ecclesial approach and they succeeded in converting or at least entering the mountains you had the Society of Divine Will, the German missionary order in my study area. You had Jesuits in other mountain provinces. You had the uh, Episcopal Church, Anglicans in yet okay. others. You I, had the I, Belgian. I, 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 I don't really want to go into the area of proselytizing religion. No, no, no. I'm just telling you. So yeah. the whole area was <laughs> introduced to modernization. Yeah. Uh, through a pacification that was not military and okay. they still maintain this autonomy that they defended for over 300 years okay wonderful till today and when okay. i went there in 1977 they had risen up again all mm -hmm. of, all across the mountains against the government of manila Mm -hmm. who wanted to exploit their rivers for hydroelectricity and their, notice the word I meant, right, their forests for mm -hmm. logging. And mm -hmm. they threw Marcos out. Mm -hmm. okay. He retreated. Okay, before we get into that, I mean, I, I, I like that whole, how, how we're touching on, you know, how um, development kind of like, uh, you know, uh, is supposedly going to be brought to them by yeah. missionaries or by these uh 
government forces or uh, uh, invading forces or whatever. From uh, the outside. Before, yeah, before, before I go into that, um, one of the reasons why I chose to actually choose this indigenous, uh, why I chose this indigenous topic is also because one of the flashpoints in current topics is the Royal Durian Plantations uh, controversy. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to perhaps maybe talk to somebody who's an expert in our local indigenous community, and that is Colin Nicholas. Um, I'm going to add Colin to... Hi, Colin. Hi. Thank you so much for making time to, for joining us, right? Uh, and um, Colin, I have from afar um, watched your work with regards to the uh, Center for Orang Asli Concerns, um, which you started how many years ago? Uh, in 1989. 1989. Years. Wow, 31 years you've been at this. And was it the first kind of uh, uh, indigenous activism that, you know, was that was that the first thing you did when you finished your studies? Uh, actually, I was involved with Orang Asli since 1983 when I was doing uh, research on them. And it, yep. after that, after running away from the bank, I went to Sabah and we started off the Pakos, the, the another NGO there. I and see. In 1989, I started the, the Center for Orang Asli Concerns. Okay. Um, okay. The Center for Orang Asli Concerns has, um, well, a center where, can you, can you just give us a, um, a brief introduction to what exactly your focus is? Yeah, it's, it's just a center. It's not a membership-based organization. Uh, Originally, in the beginning, when we first came back, uh, the idea was to let Malaysian public and Orang Asli also know about certain things that were happening in the Orang Asli field. What was what people knew about uh, Indian peoples in Malaysia at the time was about the Penans and the blockades in Sarawak. Nobody knew much about the Peninsula Malaysia Orang Asli. So the idea was to, in the first 10 years, to um, how you say, uh, create some awareness or create a, you know, interest in Orang Asli work for, among the non orang asli public and among the orang asli to to build up capacity among them so that they can represent themselves and do and uh, say what they want for, for their own future right right um I, I i think it's really interesting how you know we've got both of you here and your entry your entry into um this indigenous activism um came through different paths i, I want to go through um colin's powerpoint just give me, I've got to do a, I've got to do um, an octopus moment. Yeah. While I bring on. It's not my PowerPoint. You asked me for the photos. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yes, correct. It's my PowerPoint using your photos. <laughs> okay. Is that on? Just a moment, yeah. Something's going on with the, uh, yeah. Okay, start again. Okay, this is this is. Uh... So, Dr. Colin Nicholas, you have connections to Area Maguire, Dorel, and Vendor. And just earlier today, I discovered, hey, Colin, we're actually cousins. <laughs> because my mother is a my mother is an area, and then I found out that uh, your grandmother, right, yes. uh, is my grandfather's first cousin, so we are third cousins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we are third cousins. So that was interesting to find out, and and then you went, oh no, how many more cousins will I discover on Sarani Sembang? And I said, <laughs> this is what this is what we do here. We we go looking for cousins. <laughs> Okay, um, and you are you are you, you you say that you're the coordinator, but you're actually the founder, right? Yeah, founder and coordinator. Yeah, uh, very humble of you to want to designate yourself as coordinator. Um, but yeah, and from thirty-one years, uh, are you happy with the progress that you've made? Uh, yes, there has been tremendous progress uh, in what we have done, but there also mm -hmm. still a long way more to go for for what we want. Yeah, uh, what has what has been your biggest uh, achievement with COAC? Two, two, you... two, two things. No, one is the right. uh, for 
for land rights, which is something uh, most Indian peoples, all Indian peoples around the world are concerned about. And yeah. it's now not so easy to take over Orang Asli land. In the yes. past, just you know, run, run uh, right, rush out, rush out over them and uh, yeah. just grab the land without any compensation and so on. Now you can expect right. them to fight back. Uh, but the more important, uh, uh, I would say, progress or achievement I've seen in the last three decades or so is that the Orang Asli themselves are, are very capably, you know, uh, wising out their own position and what their own yes. demands are, and and that's what that's what it was all about. Okay, I'm going to go through uh, as I usually do with our guests, go mm -hmm. go through their families because we started out as a as a genealogical website. Um, so I, I like to kind of like. Uh, uh, let people know uh, how how the Sarani ness all started out. Um, yeah, so this is your area and Maguire grandparents, and the lady on the left seated is my grand is my great grand auntie. Um, do you remember her name? What, what's her name? Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so she's my great grand auntie, and that's your grandfather, uh, a Maguire grandfather. Basically, these are your maternal grandparents, right? Yep. And those are your two maternal uncles. That's right. Okay, and these are your parents, James Francis Owen Nicholas and Antoinette Maguire. That's right. Okay, yeah. When was this? What year would this have been? This would have been such a Mm -hmm. Just after the war, I think. Just uh, so, like late forties. Yeah, late forties. So just after the war. Mm. Okay, and this is three generations of the Maguire family. This is the maternal side. Yes. The matrilineal ancestry. Mm. That's such a stunning um, Serrani type picture of a yeah old photographs that 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 the uh, are so you know I mean like it's 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 uh. Heartwarming to see such pictures like this. Mm. And your your parents, right? Uh, were you were born in KL? Uh, yeah, in Klang. Oh, in Klang. Okay. So did you go to the Klang La Salle School or something? I, I, I studied most of the time in Penang and KL because my father okay. was with the fire services, and so he moved around quite a bit. Okay. Okay. And this is how it all began. Your your start with uh, with uh, in, an interest in in indigenous communities, right? I was a scout yeah. in St. John's Institution and in St. Xavier's for a short while before that, and scouting okay. a large part of my life for a long for much of my for the early for my teen years and my early university and until thirties and so on. Right, right. And, and and you mentioned that these were king scouts. Uh, yeah, no, the, the picture on the left is our national state team. We won the championship in the in Slango on the on right. the right. Um, many of the King Scouts in those nights in the 1970s, 72, 73, 71, 72. You yeah. know, nowadays you don't hear of uh kids doing scouting and you know, this kind of activities, right? Uh, scouting has taken a beating, uh, some some years back, you know, yeah. Uh, standard has gone very low you know you do camping in school for example but recently yep. recently in the last three four years there's been a shift in the management a change in the management and uh right they're coming back they're making a comeback have you been part of have you been part of that change have you have you uh gotten involved with the you're still in touch with the old the school our schoolmates you no know, the right. and eagle scouts but right. um, the national movement but okay that, okay and this is your okay. What year was this? This is you on the left, right? Yeah, wearing a it's, it's one of the first few days in the village, you know. I was doing field work okay. among the Maranasli for my masters. Uh, so right. Three months in this village and three months in another village. I was comparing the the penetration of a traditional village and the government resettlement scheme. Okay. Um. Where? What? What kind of a tribe was this? Was this the? It's Samai people in uh, Samai, yeah. Uh, some 20 km from Rao. In, okay. Was yeah. uh, what was your first? What can you remember the experience? Uh, what the feeling when you first kind of like went there and spent time, you know, uh, living with them? What was was what was 
can can you describe for us? Uh, yes, in a way. Well, you know, when I first came in, um, I had the letters from the police, from the Department of Aborigines, and so on. No, so right. they had no choice; they had to accept me. Okay, and uh, they couldn't. Were, were they were they reluctant? Were they reluctant to accept? They were not. They were, not. They were just they were not. Okay. excited. But you know, I came in with that view. You know, you have no choice. No, I'm right. supposed to you. But then, but the very first night itself, I stayed with them. Right. Uh, the guy on the on the to my left, uh, his name is yeah. He started okay. asking, "Do I know any contacts? You no, know, who can buy our patai? You know, at better prices and so on." You no. Know? Right. So the very first day already, they were talking about issues and you know, uh, right problems and so on. So, right. So that's then it's, it's began. Now. Okay. So so you were you were, or you could say struck by by their wanting to make a better kind of like business and stuff like that that they were were they I, I wasn't struck with that because i didn't go yeah. to do my field work among the orangasli to go and help them and solve their right. problems so on yes i was, I yep. I was, you know, I was interested in the forest not because okay. orangasli but because of jungle tracking and so on and in fact yeah. i was writing, at the time writing a manual on jungle tracking for the scouts okay so i got lots of information about how to do jungle tracking but from them from, not from them on the scouts during my scout time okay okay was how to find food how to survive and how to identify so i thought that if i do my field work among the orang asli i can learn from them so that was right like, that was right like not wow. to go in, not to try and do you know uh championing work or whatever yeah right you just wanted to go in there and and and, and find out about indigenous uh techniques uh, yeah. with regards to tracking and hunting Survival. okay hmm. right 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 and uh you know when where was that turning point when you decided oh no i i really should get involved with this community um you know i i perhaps maybe point, because when you live with the people when you, like richard was saying just now and you yeah then you have a relationship with, the, relationship with them things happen you know first family things village hmm. community level things that happen and you just can't say no you, know, you have because you have got so much from them you've got yeah. taken so much from them it's, it's time to give back and that's what we learn you know in the scouts yeah. it's all about service you know to yeah. service others and to be able to give service you have to train yourself to be able you can't be you know if somebody has a heart attack for example if you can't you can't be of service to the person you have not learned cpr for example yeah yeah, so yeah. yeah. when i live with the orang asli found out that they also work in terms of community not individuals mm -hmm. you know? the collective right. Right yeah. is more important than the individual right you no know? That's why we have a problem in the U.S. For example, they can't think of the 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 community. They think of their individual right, you no, know, to wear a mask or not to wear a mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so living with the orang asli, I learned so much from them about importance of community. You know? Okay. And having learned that, you can't just ignore them when there's a you know, re a request for assistance or you know, whatever right right so they opened your eyes to the idea that we're all interdependent on, on each other yeah okay um with regards to the recent controversy um in i think is it Rao, uh yeah. where you know there's that the the number one the uh the, the durian the durian plantation owners are crying foul right and uh but everybody forgot about the orang asli there have you been in that part of uh, malaysia have you been to the communities in that part of Malaysia? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to share with us uh, yeah. your thoughts about this yeah. whole? We all, we all uh, I mean, the, the general public is generally uh, in, in the, for the or for the durian farmers and so on, which is right, rightfully so because they have work on the land and, and somebody yeah. else comes in and just grabs their hard work and makes makes a massive profits on it. No, but we yeah. have to also remember that you no, know, some of them may have titles, some may have uh, gotten the land since nineteen forties with the from the British and so on. But right. all those lands generally were Orang Asli lands, you know. Yes. And yeah. Before, yeah. Before, the, before war, before the communist time, before the World War II, uh, the Orang Asli were dominant there, you know. And the British started giving away lands, you know, without recognizing the rights of the Orang Asli. And, right. and, and that process of giving away Orang Asli lands is still going on today. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. because the government doesn't recognize their customary rights to the traditional lands. They consider it right. forest, state forest, and they have a right to give it to anybody they want. Mm -hmm. So that problem has been going on since since time, you know, since time. Yeah, of, time immemorial, uh, right? The, the, ever since there was time, a time when people were administering the land. 
For example, mm. you were a British planter, you were interested in planting, you know, in the in the in hundred years ago, you could apply yeah. for one thousand acres of agricultural land. And that's how Kerry got Pulau Kerry and his name it. Right. There are five right. Orang Asli traditional villages there, but the whole island now is basically belonging to belongs to Sam Dabi because of uh, the coconut plantations being given to you know individuals yeah. in the past. Right, right, right. So you've worked with the uh, uh, Samai, you've worked with the Tumwans, is it correct? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the different communities and what you know about them? Um, officially, there were 18 different uh, linguistic groups among the Orang Asli, but we, we know there are 19. The team of people have been left out for, for various reasons. Right. Yeah, but um, the people in the south, Malacca, Johor, Pahang, and so on, and so on they are proto Malays or uh, Melayu Asli, they call them. And right. they speak Malay. Malay uh, Asiatic, Austro-Asiatic language, you see? So you got right. Jakuts, you got Temuans, you got Orang Selata, and so on in the south. But the people in the north, or central area in the north, the Nikritos and the Sahoy, like the Jahais, the Batek, the Samai, the Tumias, their language links are to the Khmer, the Mon Khmer language, no? Right, Austro okay. Austro-Asiatic, there was Austro... Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, two the, different, two different two different kinds of uh, languages. Oh, the, right. the Johor ones was Austronesian, not Asiatic. The northern ones also right. Austro-Asiatic. So, so okay. they are very different. They are very different. And mm -hmm. we have three communities like the Orang Kanak, for example, about 110 people, one village, mm -hmm. one community, one ethnic group. And similarly, okay. the Kansu and the Lano is one village, about 200 to 300 people. And you no know, one language group, one, com one village and one ethnic group. So we got small groups from 110 people to about uh, 58,000, the Samai and the Tamiyas and so on. Bigger wow. Yeah. So the small groups, I mean, like, they, you could say that they're almost like disappearing. Their cultures, their, their yeah. knowledge. People have been saying about them uh, since the 70s and 80s that the Kanak, for example, whose population was about uh, 60 to 80 at that time, they will be extinguished right. in no time. But now right. they are thriving, with, of course, with intermarriage and so on. But okay, mm -hmm. disappearing is what do you what do you mean by disappearing? Like, you know, as a people, as a you know, as a culture, as a, you know, yeah, culture. yeah, you're right, isn't it? Because okay. uh, because on the one hand, you can't stop uh, intermarrying, and we are all products of intermarrying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I guess I guess the next the next thing to really uh, try to achieve is uh, the documentation of these cultures. And with the documentation, then some kind of preservation can then happen, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yes. And much of that documentation is not only done by people in the universities, but by Orangasi themselves. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. How, are, how, how would the Orangasis be documenting it? Uh, um, much of, the, much of the, the, the simple ones are being done on, on YouTube, on WhatsApp and Facebook. Right. And so. okay. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. we just have a book published on Jakun Adat and customs, no, by Orang mm Asli -hmm. himself from that area. Yeah. So they are publishing their own work in blogs, in and so on, and in publications. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 in in a sense, the tech, the technology that's become available easily um, to us is also actually helping them to document and even conserve and yeah. And, and create awareness among themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, photograph that I showed uh, um, in our promo card for today's episode was the uh, University of Malaya's uh, Center for Indigenous Studies. Um, do you do work with them? Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm involved with them. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and this is a new setup, right? Mm, in the last three four years, ever since this was uh, managed by Dr. Valin, it's been. Yes. It's in the form it is now. It's been there for at least 10 years, 10 to 12 years, but not, okay. so, not so visible and active as it is today. Yeah. And one of one of the most visible things is that is that wonderful mural uh, yeah. by Orang Asli uh, indigenous artist Shak Koyo. Yes. And, uh, and, and uh, it's stunning. I mean, like, wow, uh, what a great way to promote um, awareness of, of, of the Orang Asli traditions. That's a, that's a picture of, of Masna, the Mamari woman. She's yes. the head of the women's group in the 
her community in Pulau Keri, Kampung Bumbun. Right. So right. right, right, right. For, for a mirror. Okay, okay. Um, so, but from what you heard about what uh, um, Richard does with with his wife in the Philippines, um, mm -hmm. and uh, what you are doing here with the uh, Orang Asli in Malaysia, uh, what are the kinds of things that ordinary Malaysians could also be getting involved in? I mean, apart from, you know, buying petai and not asking for a cheaper price, <laughs> you know, what else could the layman be doing uh, to assist these communities? Uh, what what would you suggest? Yeah, so so we always get a lot of uh, uh, requests from you know people who want to do CSR, and just today a couple of students called me up who was right. had to do a project for their leadership uh, course and so on, no? about doing project com com charity work or community work for the Orang Asli. But uh, we are not really in favor of all this one stop kind of thing. One day shake right. hands, yeah. and put up a face. No? Yeah. So we yeah. always tell them if you want to really want to help the Orang Asli, enter into a relationship. Okay. Yes, and so into a long-term relationship, right? Yeah, it's not for yeah. me to tell you what they want or you know what you should do for them. You enter right. a relationship, you communicate with them, then you find out what's what's needed, or they will tell you, or you know, you assess it themselves. But yeah, but most people can't do that. You know, the general public basically, what we will ask them is that when when issues come up, don't listen to you know, to what people say, government says, or whoever says no. Do your research yourself. Dig up research. Find out what's happened. You no, know, why the Orang Asli are the Orang Asli today? At one mm -hmm. time, the Orang Asli were Sultan makers. No, without the Orang Asli, many of the Sultanates would not be established today. Okay. Wow. Okay. That's history. It's very right. written history. You know, but right. Unfortunately, when when people overpopulate you, take advantage of your generosity and kindness. You know, uh, and and by your own culture, by your own uh, value system, you don't fight. You don't protest. You, you know. Right. You talk about community, right? So you yep. use other people who are greedy, who are exploitative, who are who are like in Richard's case, no, who just want to uh, gain short-term benefit for themselves without thinking of the environment, the people, and yeah. And yeah. Community. yeah. Okay. Um, do you see any kind of like uh, either of you? I mean, even Richard could ex uh, could, could could jump in. Um, you know, this this whole thing with the durian plantation stuff. I mean, shouldn't there be some kind of like tripartite uh, agreement involving the Orang Asli as well? I mean, then then it'd be really worth uh, See, worth something, right? Yeah. So so the issue here is not mm. whether uh, you can grow durians or you shouldn't grow durians. No. If you want to grow durians, if it's Orang Asli land, you recognize mm. it's Orang Asli land, enter into a joint venture. They also probably want to do it. Yeah, you know, yeah. But why do you have to grab the land first and then kick them out and then have it all for yourself? Okay, right. Um, and uh, are you involved in any particular projects at the moment that 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 uh, you can share with us? Uh, yes, yeah, don't. Right now, our work is mainly on capacity building. So, right. Um, we just, for example, just uh, two days ago, we finished a three-day training on kala farming for Orang Asli. Fisheries, no. So some group in in, in Perak uh, were interested in doing farming in their areas. Um, before that, it was organic farming. We also have a, a coalition of uh, uh, groups involved in childhood uh, early childhood education, community learning centers, where we set up uh, basically preschools, but they're more than that because the older children also come in, and it's orang asli themselves teaching themselves, not just the mainstream curriculum, but also their own curriculum. They develop modules about culture and you know, their own language and so on. And yeah, and I notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I notice also that the COAC has been actually hosting webcasts. Is uh, that webinars. correct? Yeah, webinars. Yeah, webinars. yeah together, which is uh, uh, Rally and uh, Intian and Glo Global Peace Foundation. Okay, so 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 it's a it's a collaboration with various other other organizations um, interested. Uh, we have the Orang Asli contact. They have mm -hmm. the technical know how, like really, for example, they're very good with StreamYard, which is what they're using now. And right, and so yeah. So, and that's how we feel that we should be working with other people and who are with the same common goal and mm -hmm. Orang Asli and with Orang Asli. Uh, Richard, has uh, has the Rotary Club worked with other kind of like organizations um, in order to uh, expedite or facilitate the, the work that they did in the Philippines? Or did you just do it through um, contacts that your wife had or? 
you know? I mean, like, I think, I think it's interesting when collaborations happen because it kind of like widens the base of uh, people well, getting involved. In our case, we mm -hmm. already had prior links to the community, myself, 40 years ago, researching right. them, yeah, and then yeah. the family link and so on. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we contacted a community. Uh, we had language advantage. We spoke to them, in fact, from Kuala Lumpur via mm -hmm. Facebook. Every Filipino seems to be on Facebook and Messenger. And um, we then identified a local Rotary Club. Okay. Mm -hmm. With whom we could work with. Now the problem is that Rotary Club had no, uh, uh, would not venture into the mountains because lowlanders are very nervous about <laughs> yeah, entering okay. forested areas and mm -hmm. entering mountains, especially with the security concern in the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. communist uh, so-called communist party and 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 the new people's army so we pioneered uh, uh, entering into the community and took the local filipino rotarians into the mountain they were very nervous they said why are, how are you all not nervous i said don't worry nothing's going to happen because we mm -hmm. know the anthropological man of introducing yourself to leaders introducing yourself to the community you don't just march in and start dispensing goods yeah yeah uh to yeah, coming in like some kind and, of like uh saviors yeah mm -hmm. yes you know, like father christmas so yeah. we did that they mm -hmm. came along i remember it was quite funny the first visit which they facilitated by getting uh, giving us uh, their four-wheel drives to go drive up into the mountain they told us that they had arranged for a military escort. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, what is going on? <laughs> because if the communists are operating there, a military escort would yes, yeah, attract sure. mm -hmm. uh, uh, an ambush. I said, I yeah. pray and hope that the, uh, the escort is going to be 500 yards in front of us or 500 yards behind us. So if bullets start flying, they'll get hit, not us. Now, yeah, here yeah. is another reality about the Philippines. The day we were supposed to go up into the mountains, there was a typhoon passing by the northern Philippines, Batanes, between uh, uh, the northern Philippines and Taiwan. And mm. a whiplash of rain yeah. was bearing down on our area. And the Philippine military never showed up. They uh, too wet. <laughs> So okay. we were there. And no, well, that, that's, no, uh, uh, sounds kind of familiar, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. Especially but, but, in the but, Philippines, where the military is concerned, uh, and they said, "Oh God, uh, God, God is uh, thank goodness that God has intervened." And we drove up straight to the mountains, met with the community, and we introduced these lowland Filipinos living just an hour or forty minutes, fifty minutes away, drive yeah, away yeah. through yeah. Kuala Lumpur Rotarians to that community and today they work uh, and move up and down without any fear. So you see, we can do such things even from a distance and get mm. local community because of the uh, historical divide between uplanders and lowlanders uh, to work yeah. together. So yeah. the, that that is the sort of thing we can do. Now with social media and so on, we can actually be communicating uh, our experiences in the Philippines together with maybe the Orang Asli Center for Orang Asli Kusan or even yeah. local Orang Asli groups. Yeah. For example, the, the point that um, Colin was making about the Orang, about the uh, Musa King uh, Durian, mm -hmm. this is what we did. And this be, I did this 30 years ago. We mapped in great detail the, or, uh, the indigenous, indigenous areas people. in the mm -hmm. study province. And we then said, this is indigenous and this is not. We laid mm -hmm. a map claim, not just words, because words don't exist in people. You know, people forget. A map is something physical. You can see it. And we printed these maps in very, very large formats. In those days, we had to do ammonia prints because there was no such thing as Xerox. Uh, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, 
and we distributed these maps all over the mountain. The military were running around grabbing them and trying to hide them from the community. And we were, I was printing the maps in Manila, bringing them and distributing them almost as fast or faster than. You see, Colin, this is something you, Oranga, the Orang Asli may want to go there. Declare your ownership as a map or some other legal document. A map is a legal document in Malaysia and stand by it. Get your support groups, Orang Asli, Center for Orang Asli Concern, other NGOs in Malaysia, the church, uh, if you, if, uh, that, who, who could get involved, international indigenous movements to defend those areas as Orang Asli land. Now, then you I, I had a very I, good idea of working yeah, I, 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 yeah. with... I, I think I, I kind uh, of like know... I, I think I kind of like understand uh, Colin's approach, which is basically to empower the communities and members of the community yeah. first. Yeah. Is that okay. correct? That is what you have. Yeah. For example, that for example, just you're... last night, just last night here in our center, yeah. we had a group yeah. from a community who were coming here whose land was being taken for to be gazetted for development in the Kuala Langat North Forest uh, Reserve. Right. We were here yeah. for training on how to to do the community profile, how to do how yeah. to do the community mapping and so on. And in the last two years, two and a half years, under Google, uh, the Orang Asli themselves have mapped out 52 of their own villages. You know, and and these maps, community maps not just the extent of the boundary but also the content of their traditional territory Good. have been used right. have been used in court cases successfully to yeah. uh, to to get judgments in their favor for their customary lands and you're talking about thousands of acres not 10 20 acres no like uh the, the case in the picture you see there is a talk uh, yes. point in show it's nine thousand he uh, hectares of uh forest reserve and national park areas declared mm -hmm. as well land but all, all this, of course, you have to have a map. Otherwise, judges mm -hmm. and lawyers don't understand, you see. But my, yeah. my problem is, and I take up uh, from Richard also, is that yeah. uh, maybe give the wrong impression that we don't do the work. No, don't get me wrong. We are a center, very small. We facilitate. You know? yeah. the, the, the community learning centers, all the projects you're talking about, it's all done by the Orang Asli. You know? yeah. Yeah. People know us, so we put them in touch with the community. They, they, the, the, Orang, the Orang Asli get the funds directly. They have their own committees. They account for it. They write the reports. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's that's the way to go. Because uh, if you work through organizations, then you know a lot of things can happen. And it, it's the, the most important thing is that it's as if you don't trust the organs. They can can do it themselves. You need somebody yeah, yeah. else. Yeah, it's all about empowering, isn't it? Empowering so yeah, that people they don't... Work empowering all the time. You know, empowering. Yeah. And the villa house for somebody say, "Oh, that's empowering." No, there's nothing of that sort. Empowering, empowering means literally having to listen to them and, and, yeah. and agreeing that allowing them to determine for themselves what they want, how do, how they want it, and when, and you know, and all these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. you may not agree with what they want, but uh, you no. Know, if that's what they want, that's what they want. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You have to convince them, but you know, if you don't agree with it, but it's still if the community decides, we have to give in. Yeah. 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 So it, what are you, what is your, uh, you know, wish, what is on your wish list? What is at the top of your wish list in terms of your what, work with indigenous communities? The problem with Orang Asli today, for mm -hmm. me, after seeing it uh, in the, for the last so many years, is yeah. that there's no one personality among them, one leader among them right. that, that comes close to the likes of, let's say, Nelson Mandela. Right. Can unite yeah. all the various factions, no? Yeah, those yeah. pro the end, pro amno, those who are pro Akatan, those who are yeah. pro Muslim, yeah. like conservative, yeah. pro Japo, yeah. all kinds of factions, yeah. the youth, the young ones, and so on. It's the, the, the government has done a very good job of splitting the Orang Asli uh, for right. the last few years. So right. it's, it takes somebody of very uh, you know, high charisma, high mm -hmm. uh, intelligence, mm -hmm. high uh, commitment to bring them yeah. together. We just don't have right. that now. Yeah, yeah. But I guess uh, with with the rise of like social media, maybe maybe certain heroes might start to come through, certain champions whom people can. Yeah, I hope so. I yeah. hope so. Mm. Right. Are there any personalities that we should be looking to in terms of like giving us an indication as to uh, you know no, what, I think what we should be looking for? Fresh people with fresh mm -hmm. uh, viewpoints, with uh, a very open and very indigenous way of uh, 
looking at the solutions right what yeah. we're hearing from the orang asli is always complaints about you know this issue this happening encroachments and so yeah. on but we're not yeah. looking at solutions you know if the law is bad but how are you going to change the law what needs to be changed you no know? what the uh, yeah. what other things needs to be done you no know? the structures and yeah. so on so that's yeah. not come to that level yet okay okay um okay could richard I, you mm -hmm. uh, could i uh, just jump in uh, the reason why the igorots in the cordillera mountains were able to resist the spanish uh, invasion or attempts of the spanish to enter their territories for over 300 years and likewise mm -hmm. the americans took fright for the same reason uh, to militarily enter the mountains was in one word the budong and that Which is, is you had all of these villages Inspector. hundreds of them all over the mountains they didn't have one leader or one mandela or anybody but no. they were linked by these peace packs village to village one village would have like treaties with 17 other villages all signed the agreement was if one is attacked or if one is threatened, the, all the others would rally in support. I and agree, that Richard. kept the Spaniards out. So yes. one thing is to get your Orangasti settlements networked so that they will stand together. That's the yes, Philippine experience. I agree with you, but there's some fundamental differences, okay? The Igorots in the Cordilleras, they are the majority. They control the lands. They are fighting people. The mm -hmm. Orang Asli in Peninsular Malaysia, not just are they in, in, no, in very different communities, they are minority, less than half a percent of the population. Okay? If you're talking about the Karazans and the, the Sarawak Dayak natives, I can agree with you. And secondly, yeah, yeah. The, the peace pact, this kind of peace pact agreements were in, were in practice in the Orang Asli a long time ago. For example, during the emergency, when when the when the Chinese insurgents went into the communist insurgents went into the forest and got help from the Orang Asli, uh, those who were close to the communist side, you know, entered were, were going through the motions of uh, helping the communists, and but those who were close to the British side, the Malayan government side, went through the motions of helping the the Malayan government. You know, but yeah. the, they had an agreement, an eight point treaty, whereby no orang asli community will, will, will do anything to bring harm to the other community so when they gave information to the british or to the chinese or to the communists they will give information which was two three weeks old which was useless but they went through the motions of supporting whoever was you know because they wouldn't they didn't know who would win the war so this kind of agreements were there in the past and are there and are still there in place as that is why the, the customary lands of every community is very well defined there's no overlapping there's no people fighting for you no know, uh, right yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, among themselves there's no yeah. inter intercommunal fights yeah okay yes so so the so the issue of uh i mean you talk about keeping the americans out that's cam hayes uh, whatever you call that in in baguio see the americans were there the americans were controlling the area the the, the big companies also were coming in and until today um yeah, if you want to compare, that no, wait, wait, if, you, if you want to compare, time. if you want to compare the 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 Tingians or the Cordillera peoples, the Igorots, you must compare it to the Malays of Peninsular Malaysia and the Dayaks. No, how they kept the yeah. colonials out, mm. but they were the majority people of the territory then, not the Indian people, uh, but the majority peoples. I guess yeah, it's very Colin. easy to prescribe solutions when you know you're not 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 living among them and really experiencing what they have mm. to deal with. Uh, yeah. Um, but I just want to make one point. Uh, to just be, let us be careful. Baguio was in fact a Spanish town. That was the foothold that they were able to establish. The Americans also, the American base, uh, Camp Hayes. But that's as far as they got. They did not get further. Uh, and the Igoros were able to to uh, to sustain. Uh, to even, the Japanese, there. even the Japanese didn't go very far until Sagara, I think. Yeah, but it was only on the main, the main road, the, the Halsema yeah. Highway, for example. Uh, so it uh, basically, uh, what you said was uh, quite right. The Igorots and the Muslims in the southern Philippines, let's not forget, they're also tribal, but they are Islamized. The 
tribal people in the Philippines are now Christianized since uh, the 19, at, at early 20th century. They are a, they have a fighting spirit that has developed over the centuries. The Orang Asli may not be so uh, empowered in their own history. They seem to have a well, much yeah, more culturally. Culture. They, they never really had. Totally, totally disagree with that statement. Uh, okay. What you see the Orang Asli today is not what the Orang Asli was 100, 200, 300 years ago. No. Okay. So there were many wars. The Prang Sankil, for example, in Perak, no, among Orang Asli, Orang Asli were involved. But invariably, invariably, the Orang Asli were always outnumbered, out mm. weapon, you know, out weaponry, yeah. you know, and yeah. so on. So their strategy has always been to flee rather than fight, because yeah. you fight, you're going to just obliterate yourself. You know? And yeah. that's why the Orang Asli were never always living deep in the forest. They were living, you no, know, who would want to live in the, you no, know, deep forest? You no, know? people will live by the coastal areas, you know, by by the rivers where everything is so easy and plentiful. See. But the invaders came in, the, the, mm -hmm. the new migrants came in and took over those lands and after all the fights. And this thing is still happening. Right. The only problem yeah. now is that there's no more place to run to. That's why right. they're fighting. Okay. Um, yeah, that 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 on top of your wish list that that you know that one leader to unite to unite uh, I didn't uh, say one leader, I just some some kind of leadership. Like, yeah, some kind of leadership. organization yeah. or whatever, but to just mm -hmm. bring everybody on a common platform. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, on a com yeah, common ground, looking for common ground. Um, and yeah, it's uh, great thoughts there. Um, yeah, Could any I, um, last words Vernon, from, yeah? Yeah, Vernon. You, you want? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I just wanted to bring up this in which we were discussing it prior to your uh, coming on of, uh, officially at six. And yeah. that is how do we define indigeneity in Malaysia mm -hmm. and in the Philippines? Um, who is indigenous? Who is not? According to the UNDRIP, the uh, United Nations Declaration on the uh, Rights of Indigenous People, tribal Filipinos are indigenous, but Christianized Filipinos in the lowlands largely are not. In Malaysia, who is indigenous? Or actually mm -hmm. are indigenous according to the UN Declaration? The Malays are not because they're the majority. And they've been Islamized. Now, think about that. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, you know, uh, who is indigenous in Germany? The Germans? The Fra in France? Who? In England? Uh, the United Kingdom? After all, the English I think, are invaded. Uh, yeah, I, I think those kind of the, that that kind of labeling, uh, you know, and tagging um, is interesting by its by itself. Yeah. Um, but, but eventually, I bring up this question. This question, mm -hmm. uh, I think about that. Huh? These are the, the labels that we attach. Yeah. Are the Eurasians indigenous? The Eurasian, Sarani, Christian, uh, uh, Christang, Portuguese, are they indigenous? After well, all, I, 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 our conversation started with the fact that uh, on, on the, on the uh, Sarani Sembang Facebook page, I, I, I pointed out the existence of this community in, in Canada, right. which is mixed race, French and indigenous. And they have right. been labeled as indigenous to Canada. Um, I yeah. pointed it out not so much, you know, to claim that I'm indigenous or that we should be indigenous, etc., but to say how, you know, label labelize, labelization and and tagging uh, is is quite, you know, almost arbitrary and very interesting. I mean, like one of the one of the things that 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 came to mind when I saw that article was in Singapore several years ago. When a young Eurasian boy uh, started the revival of the Kristang language, the Koda Kristang, he put up, uh, his name is Kevin Martins Wong, and he put up his family tree. And what was really interesting was that he had no qualms about actually showing that his ancestry also included indigenous people as well as freed slaves. And he had names and photographs. And I thought that was really interesting. And the reason why I find it interesting is that it really shows how diverse and you know fascinating you know uh, everybody is, and and we we should we should we should uh, respect the diversity that exists. Um, yeah. So in terms of indigeneity, I mean it's really interesting um, for us to be talking about it. But I'm also more interested in how our indigenous people are really marginalized 
um, do not have platforms um, and perhaps maybe require some kind of like, uh, you know, uh, inclusion into our, and, and it's very interesting to hear what Colin was saying that perhaps the best thing we can do is actually build relationships with our mm. indigenous, uh, yeah. you know, fellows, but fellow men. Can I, can I interject on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go on. Um, first of all, in, in Malaysia, in Malaysia, as yeah. far as the, we are concerned, uh, we use the international definition of Indian peoples, yeah. so called loose definition of Indian peoples, to yeah. refer to the Orang Asli, the, the Sabah and Sarawak natives, as the Orang Asal. We use the term Orang Asal, and some people in government just don't like it. But yeah. basically, an Indian person or Indian peoples are uh, the original or, or, or the earliest inhabitants of a territory, of a place, you know, and the descendants of that uh, of those peoples. You know? And yeah. in contrast to people who were who was who have settled here, who have occupied the lands, who have colonized the areas. You no, know? yeah. So if you are one of these three, you don't you're not indigenous. But yeah. in Malaysian definition of Indian peoples, especially for Orang Asli, it is not a blood definition, it's a cultural definition. That mm -hmm. means if you are an Orang Asli, you're an Orang Asli if you belong to an Orang Asli community, speak the Orang Asli language and and practice the Orang Asli way of life, just like Malay. So if you are an if you're a Chinese baby, for example, and there were many Chinese babies who were adopted by Orang Asli during the emergency, yeah. your brother is an Orang Asli, speak the Semai language and all and practice Semai culture, for example, you are an Orang Asli. Yeah. Even though yeah. you do not have a single drop of Orang Asli blood, no? So that's yeah. that's genetically okay. yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I completely go with you on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like the the Metis, uh situation you're talking about in Canada, a yeah. very important uh, uh, criteria or factor that's used in the international definition uh, in, in, uh, international definition of Indian peoples is self identity. You identify yeah. as an Indian person, and your community accepts you as that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You identify and a community accepts you, and that's it. And that's okay. That is basically I, I would like to raise end of, this question. end of argument. Yeah. All right. I would like to raise this question, which I have on various other forums. The I'm going to talk about the Malacca Portuguese. Mm -hmm. To me, the Malacca Portuguese are by definition an indigenous people. They were created in Malaya. They didn't exist anywhere else. They were they are not Portuguese. They are not Europeans. They didn't exist until they were procreated and became a community in Malaysia. So I have been raising this question with the Malacca Portuguese community leaders as to whether they could apply perhaps to the UN to be accepted in the UN list as an indigenous community like the Metis in, um, in Canada and there's another mixed group in uh, uh, Brazil, and have them recognized as an indigenous. The Malaysian government recognizes the Sarani, Eurasian, and uh, Malacca Portuguese as a sort of semi-indigenous group because you... Uh, we get the ASB. You get the ASB. So the question is, in the Malacca situation, yeah is I have raised this, but the community, some community activists are moving in the other direction of wanting to define themselves as Portuguese, not as Kristang, which is their original word, or Sarani, a word that you have promoted, uh, Vernon, something local to make mm -hmm. sure that Malaya is their homeland. Now, if you call yourself Portuguese, or I call myself Dutch, or somebody else calls themselves German, uh, yeah. the, the not going to be recognized as indigenous, are we? Because we have placed our focus of somewhere uh, <laughs> origin somewhere else. And that's the yeah. uh, status of the debate, uh, the discussion at the moment. Yeah. Actually, this question of self-identity is very, very important. You it mentioned is. about uh, the, the, what do you call it, the Portuguese you know, being given Amna Saham and so on in those days, recognized as Bumi Putra. That was political. Because Mahathir yes. was in a situation, was in a situation whereby Amno was broken up, the Amno, Amno was deregistered in order to get back the 50% plus one membership, in order to get all the assets back to the Amno Baru, he had to have 50% of the old membership plus one. And therefore, he opened it to the Eurasians and he opened it to the Siamese community in, in northern, northern 
Kedah and Kelantan, you see. So they were considered yeah. Bumiputra also. So, so that's a different yeah. story altogether. But, yeah, but and what, the question of self identity is very important. Yes. Because uh, at one time, uh, many orang asli didn't want to identify as orang asli. They were ashamed because they were looked down upon in school. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, bullied and so yeah. on. So they yeah. were not say they are orang asli. But to now it's totally different because of politics, because of the cultural mm -hmm. awareness and so on. Yeah. Yeah. My my family mm -hmm. only very recently. I found out about our Asian roots because we are supposed to be Eurasian, right? You know, I know a lot about my European side because I have a cousin, you know, Nina Vendot, who does very good work yeah. on the genealogy. Yeah. But yeah. I, later on, I found out there's Ceylonese blood yeah. in me, there's mm -hmm. uh, Siamese blood in me because one one uh, ancestor was fooling around with the the, the courtroom, you know, something like that. Yeah. You know? And yeah. all this, but we don't know much about our Asian side. So we, sometimes in different times of history, we choose what you want to identify because it's politically uh what do you call it beneficial expedient. Uh, yeah expedient. it's expedient it's uh yeah um uh, uh you, you talked about self-identity and and how chinese people were adopted by the orang asli and can and should be allowed to be orang asli i mean like one of the reasons why i'm on this sarani mission of mine is also because of my two maternal grandmothers one was a genetically chinese thai woman who was adopted by a sarani family you know, and so I, and she became the bastion of everything traditionally Sarani. You know, she knew all the prayers, she knew all the recipes, etc. So, how can she not be Sarani? And uh, I just like the whole idea that, you know, so the Sarani ness is a is an inclusion of of anything. You know, and uh, that's that's the beauty of it. You know, it doesn't have to come down to the color of your skin. It just has to come down to you know. The the, uh, the 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 character in you and 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 what how you feel uh, um, about your culture and and your family. So I mean, like on the one hand, the thing about the Europeanness in Eurasia is easier to follow because of because of church records and yeah. photography and stuff like that. The Asian side is a lot harder to trace, but I think the conversations about the Asian side should always exist and should always be questioned. No, and it's always not be. Because it's not difficult to trace. It was the yeah. policy then of for the British, for example, because yeah. my colleague in the center, Tony yeah. Williams, his father is British. Right. And he married an orang asli woman, you know? Right. And as soon as he did that, he was disowned by the family. Right. You're not supposed yeah. to marry a local or get involved with a yeah. local for the British, you know? Yeah. It's different yeah. 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 Portuguese. Yeah. Yeah. The Portuguese. Yeah. The Portuguese was, you know, spread your seed kind of thing. British was... Yeah. Spread your seat, but don't don't make it open. Yeah, open yeah, no? yeah, 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 yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, any last words uh, as we close this this particular episode? It's been really fascinating listening to both of you um, talk about you know the, the the things that drive you in terms of indigenous affairs and your activism. Um, any anything that you want to say, uh, Richard and Colin, about about this situation, about you know Eurasian Saranis being involved with indigenous people is there is there some kind of like uh something happening with regards to are you identifying with the uh with the uh minorityness that we as a people face um you know is, is that what makes makes it part of the drive do you think i think ident identifying yourself with a particular ethnic group is not a good thing mm -hmm. if if you're doing it for a reason which is uh no not for the community, not for the good betterment of people. So yep. for, for an orang asli, the, mm -hmm. there are certain core values which they hold very, very strongly to, you know? And, right. and that translates into love for the environment, yep. respect for people, co-responsibility and so on. But if yep. you, as, as an orang, even though you are an orang asli, a thorough bred orang asli, and you become yep. a, a logger yourself or an exploiter of people and so on, I don't consider you an orang asli. You have lost your values as an orang asli. Right. You're just yeah, an orang asli yeah. by blood, you know, yeah, and yeah. fighting that. So it's more yeah. important to know what is it that makes you a, a Eurasian, a Chinese, or an orang asli, you know, in terms of the the, the, the person, the makeup of the person that, that 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 is involved, rather than, you know, the passport definition of. Or yeah, 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 yeah. What yeah, I think Sarayness for me is about being as inclusive to the max as possible. You know, listening and uh, being empathetic and stuff like that because. Because we, yeah, we, our ancestors probably, you know, uh, uh, came up against a lot of, a lot, of, a lot of difficulties, um, not being part of the mainstream, 
you know? And so we should always remember that not being part of the mainstream is, um, is, is, is something that should always, we should always, we should always be aware of, 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 uh, of, uh, power plays that exist culturally or politically or, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know whether that makes sense, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Vernon, yeah. I think we have to recognize that the, I'll use the word Eurasian, this European hyphen Asian mix was born out of a, an, a, a, an attempt at cross-cultural uh, mixture, a European marrying an Asian. The result, however, the children found themselves neither accepted by the Europeans, otherwise all of us with European names, surnames would all be European and would all have been taken back to Europe. And also yeah, that's, what not, hmm? that's what I'm saying. That that, that, that yes. the very first and also, very, wait, hold on. The very first and results of that interracial by the mm -hmm. Asian. So you had this orphan group of people rejected by both sides who yeah, gravitated together. together and formed themselves into what we have now recognized as the Eurasian, the Kristang in, in the case, or in your case, uh, Sarani in, in Penang, and places like that. But now, I want to tell you this, and something we all better think very carefully about. My family, I've done some research on interracial marriages in Malaysia, um, in the Eurasian community. Um, because I was involved in Eurasian unity and uh, other discussions in the early 70s and 80s. My parents' generation, 80% or more, would marry either a fellow Eurasian, hence all the interrelatedness uh, of, of these families, or if they could the, find the gold standard, a European, 80%. One generation later, my generation, that percentage is flipped. Mm -hmm. It's 80% marrying out of those of us who stayed. And this is the other problem. Those who stayed, not who migrated. And 20% may be marrying within. And that is literally something that we are converting ourselves into another race or something else. It's no longer, it's, the hyphens are continuing yeah, now. Isn't it? No, 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 it's, it's zero. So now, oh, is that I personally pushing the word Sarani, I'll turn around and say, why don't we just call ourselves Malayan? For those in Sananjong, Sarawakian in Sabah, uh, Sarawak and Sabahan in Sabah. In other words, if the mixtures are going to get so complicated, we will have to have a bigger tent. Yeah, well, this is what happened. We're all so complicated that we should, you know, embrace yes. everything. You know, right. And this inclusive. is what happened in America, where you had, of course, the Italians and the English and the Greeks and yeah, the yeah. Russians and the Germans. They were all marrying each other. I'm not talking about marrying blacks. Huh? They had to create a, an inclusive term. Otherwise, how are you going to have hyphen, 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 hyphen? They came what up with white. Inclusive? White. <laughs> OK. The white race. What the hell is a white race? Caucasian? They yeah, yeah. had You're to right. create yeah. I can, yeah. Okay, I, I've got to end. I've got to end. Okay, okay. <laughs> we are okay, also the, going to, have to create an inclusive term. Yes. So, but yeah, my 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 basic this thing is that uh, yeah uh, uh, the, the the distancing from the from the identity of Sarani is to me uh, you know reminds me that perhaps maybe we want to distance ourselves from what is what is local and what is uh, uh, assumed to be you know Malay. You know, and stuff like that. And but it's part of our DNA. Um, okay, uh, Colin, anything that you'd like to say? No, nope, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me. Um, you know, it's it's it, it was it was it was uh, uh, not much notice because uh, this is a fly by the seat of my pants production. Uh, mm -hmm. But thank you so much for sharing um, stories about your family, about your passions, and. Um, you know, the, the, the activism in indigenous affairs that the both of you have been involved in. I wish the both of you all the best. And if there's anything that our Sarani community can do to help you along the way,
please, you know, use uh, this this Facebook group page, whatever, to let us know. You know, like if you are if you'd like to promote the talks that you're doing, Colin, um, you were mentioning the webinars and stuff. Uh, punch it through. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank, thank you so you. much, everybody. Yeah. Thanks thank a lot. You, All bless. God bless. Yeah. God bless. Wonderful. Bye bye. Good night. Good night to everybody. I'm trying to play our. Uh, Violet, Richard. Yeah, regards to Violet, who was supposed to join us but didn't. So you went yeah. into your men's planning mode, <laughs> which I, which I yeah. wanted to avoid, <laughs> which I so wanted to avoid. Okay, good night, everybody. Have a great rest good of night. the weekend. Good Bye. Night. Congratulations on 20 years of Sarani Sembang. This is indeed a milestone. And this success is a reflection of your passion, dedication, creativity, and tenacity. Happy to call you my friend. And let me try in the mother tongue of my grandmother to wish you well. Yoreza Deus Logu Benzekubos Tududia. God bless and lots of love.